All right, class, um, we are continuing on chapter five. This is the second half of chapter five um, in your version that starts on page 88. Um, really pay attention now to comradeship, esprit de corps, remember in French that means the spirits of the group. That's one of the themes we're tracking in the novel. So be looking at that, like that band of brothers, um, I've got your back, no matter what kind of thing. The orderly room shows signs of life. Himmelstoss seems to have stirred them up. At the head of the column trots the fat sergeant major. It is strange that almost all of the regular sergeant majors are fat. Himmelstoss follows him, thirsting for vengeance. His boots gleam in the sun. We get up. Where's Jaden? The sergeant puffs. No one knows, of course. Himmelstoss glowers at us wrathfully. You know very well. You won't say. That's the fact of the matter. Out with it. Fatty looks round inquiringly, but Jaden is not to be seen. He tries another way. Jaden will report at the orderly room in 10 minutes. Then he steams off with Himmelstoss in his wake. I have a feeling that next time we go up wiring, I'll be letting a bundle of wire fall on Himmelstoss's leg, hints Krapp. We'll have quite a lot of jokes with him, laughs Mueller. That is our sole ambition, to knock the conceit out of a postman. I go into the hut and put Jaden wise. He disappears. Then we change our posse and lie down again to play cards. We know how to do that, to play cards, to swear, and to fight. Not much for 20 years, and yet too much for 20 years. Half an hour later, Himmelstoss is back again. Nobody pays any attention to him. He asks for Jaden. We shrug our shoulders. Then you'd better find him, he persists. Haven't you been looking for him? Crop lies back on the grass and says, have you ever been out here before? That's none of your business, retorts Himmelstoss. I expect an answer. Very good, says Kropp, getting up. See up there where those little white clouds are? Those are anti-aircraft. We were over there yesterday, five dead and eight wounded, and that's a mere nothing. Next time when you go up with us, before they die, the fellows will come up to you, click their heels, and ask stiffly, please may I go? Please may I hop it? We've been waiting here a long time for someone like you. He sits down again, and Himmelstoss disappears like a comet. Three days CB, conjectures Cat. Next time I'll let it fly, I say to Albert. But that is the end. The case comes up for trial in the evening. In the orderly room sits our Lieutenant Bertink and calls us in one after another. I have to appear as a witness and explain the reason of Jaden's insubordination. The story of the bedwetting makes an impression. Himmelstoss is recalled and I repeat my statement. Is that right? Bertink asks Himmelstoss. He tries to evade the question, but in the end has to confess, for Krapp tells the same story. Why didn't someone report the matter then? asks Bertink. We are silent. He must know himself how much use it is in reporting such things. It isn't usual to make complaints, complaints in the army. He understands it all right, though, and lectures Himmelstoss, making it plain to him that the front isn't a parade ground. Then comes Jaden's turn. He gets a long sermon and three days open arrest. Bertink gives Krop a wink and one day's open arrest. It can't be helped, he says to him regretfully. He is a decent fellow. Open arrest is quite pleasant. The clink was once a foul house. There we can visit the prisoners. We know how to manage it. Close, the, close arrest would have meant the cellar. So he's going to, three days he's going under arrest, but he gets to stay in a cell, jail cell, where people can visit him. They used to tie us to a tree, but that is forbidden now. In many ways, we are treated quite like men. An hour later, Jaden and Krapp are settled in behind our wire netting. We make our way, excuse me. An hour later, after Jaden and Krapp are settled in behind their wire netting, we make our way into them. Jaden greets us, crowing. Then we play scat far into the night. Jaden wins, of course, lucky wretch. When we break it up, Kat says to me, what do you say to some roast goose? Not bad, I agree. We climb up on the munition wagon. The ride costs us two cigarettes. Cat has marked the spot exactly. The shed belongs to a regimental headquarters. I agree to get the goose and receive my instructions. The outhouse is behind the wall and the door shuts with just a peg. Cat hoists me up. I rest my foot in his hands and climb over the wall. Cat keeps watch below. I wait a few moments to accustom my eyes to the darkness. Then I recognize the shed. Softly I steal across, lift the peg, pull it out and open the door. I distinguish two white patches, two geese. That's bad. If I grab one, the other will cackle. Well, both of them, if I'm quick, it can be done. I make a jump. 
I catch hold of one and the next instant the second. Like a madman, I bash their heads against the wall to stun them, but I haven't quite enough weight. The beasts cackle and strike out with their feet and wings. I fight desperately, but Lord, what a kick a goose has. They struggle and I stagger about. In the dark, these two white patches are terrifying. My arms have grown wings and I'm almost afraid of going up into the sky as though I held a couple of captive balloons in my fists. Then the row begins. One of them gets his breath and goes off like an alarm clock. Before I can do anything, someone comes in from outside. I feel a blow, lie outstretched on the floor, and hear awful growls. A dog. I steal a glance to the side. He makes a snap at my throat. I lie still and tuck my chin into my collar. It's a bulldog. After an eternity, he withdraws his head and sits down beside me. But if I make the least movement, he growls. I consider. The only thing to do is get hold of my small revolver, and that too, before anyone arrives. Inch by inch, I move my hand toward it. I have the feeling that it lasts an hour, the slightest movement, and then an awful growl. I lie still, then try again. When at last I have the revolver in my hand, my hand starts to tremble. I press it against the ground and stay over to myself, jerk the revolver up, fire before he has a chance to grab, and then jump up. Slowly, I take a deep breath and become calmer. Then I hold my breath, whip up the revolver. It cracks. The dog leaps howling to one side. I make for the door of the shed and fall head over heels over one of the stuttering geese. At full speed, I seize it again and with a swing, toss it over the wall and clamber up. No sooner am I on top than the dog is up again as lively as ever and springs at me. Quickly, I let myself drop. Ten paces away stands Cat with the goose under his arm. As soon as he sees me, we run. So right there, um, we get almost this like comical situation trying to get the geese. But then it gets serious when the dog shows up that could kill him. Think about how the pace was increased there. We talked about it earlier. What does remark do with sentence structure? Okay. Um, are they really long sentences with lots of semicolons? Um, or are they short sentences, quick and easy to read? At last, we can take a breather. The goose is dead. Cat saw to that in the moment. We intend to roast it at once so that nobody will be any wiser. I fetch a Dixie and wood from the hut and we crawl into a small deserted lean-to which we use for such purposes. The single window space is heavily curtained. There is a sort of hearth, an iron plate set on some bricks. We kindle a fire. Cat plucks and cleans the goose. We put the feathers carefully to one side. We intend to make two cushions out of them with the inscription, sleep soft under shell fire. The sound of the gunfire from the front penetrates into our refuge. The glow of the fire lights up our faces, shadows dance on the wall. Sometimes a heavy crash and the lean to be shivers. Airplanes, bombs. Once we hear a stifled cry, a hut must have been hit. Airplane drones, the tack tack of machine guns breaks out, but no light that could be observed shows from us. We sit opposite one another, Cat and I, two soldiers in shabby coats, cooking a goose in the middle of the night. We don't talk much, but I believe we have a more complete communion with one another than even lovers have. Now think about that. Um, to have a communion is to have um, a, a connection, like a co-union. Okay, that's where the word comes from. He says that he and Kat sitting there, it's closer than two lovers, two spouses, two um, super close individuals would have. We are two men, two minute sparks of life, outside in the night and the circle of death. We sit on the edge of it, crouching in danger. The grease drips from our hands. In our hearts, we are close to one another, and the hour is like the room, flecked over with the lights and shadows of our feelings cast by a quiet fire. What does he know of me, or I of him? Formerly, we should not have had a single thought in common. Now we sit with the goose between us and feel in unison, are so intimate that we do not even speak. It takes a long time to roast a goose, even when it is young and fat, so we take turns. One bathes it while the other lies down and sleeps. A grand smell gradually fills the hut. The noises without increase in volume, pass into my dream and yet linger in my memory. In a half sleep, I watch Cat dip and raise the ladle. I love him, his shoulders, his angular stooping figure. And at the same time, I see behind him woods and stars and a clear voice utters words that bring me peace. To me, a soldier in big boots, belt and knapsack, taking the road that lies before him under the high heaven, quickly forgetting and seldom sorrowful, forever pressing on under the wide night sky. 
a little soldier in a clear voice, and if anyone were to caress him, he would hardly understand this soldier with the big boots and the shut heart, who marches because he is wearing big boots and has forgotten all else but marching. Beyond the skyline is a country with flowers, lying so still that he would like to weep. There are sights there that are as forgotten, that he has not forgotten, because he never possessed them. Perplexing and yet lost to him. Are not his twenty summers there? Is my face wet, and where am I? Cat stands before me. His gigantic stooping shadow falls upon me, like home. He speaks gently, his smile, he smiles and goes back to the fire. Then he says, it's done. Yes, cat. I stir myself. In the middle of the room shines the brown goose. We take out our collapsible forks and our pocket knives and each cuts off a leg. With it, we have army bread dipped in gravy. We eat slowly and with gusto. How does it taste, cat? Good. And yours? Good, cat. We are brothers and press on one another the choicest pieces. Afterwards, I smoke a cigarette and cat a cigar. There is still a lot left. How would it be, cat, if we took a bit to crop in Jaden? Sure, says he. We carve off a portion and wrap it up carefully in newspaper. The rest we thought of taking over to the hut. Cat laughs and simply says, Jaden. I agree, we will have to take it all. So we go off to the fowl house to waken them. But first we pack away the feathers. Crop and Jaden take us for magicians. Then they get busy with their teeth. Jaden holds a wing in his mouth with both hands like a mouth organ and gnaws. He drinks the gravy from the pot and smacks his lips. May I never forget you. We go to our hut. Again, there is the lofty sky with the stars and the oncoming dawn, and I pass beneath it, a soldier with big boots and a full belly, a little soldier in the early morning. But by my side, stooping and angular, goes Cat, my comrade. The outlines of the huts are upon us in the dark, in the dawn, like a dark, deep, so again, like I said at the start, think about the comradeship, these descriptions of them being closer than lovers and of them um, as they push on each other the choicest pieces of meat. So they want the other one to eat the best part of the goose. Um, they want to like sacrifice the best part so the other one can eat it and enjoy it. All right, that is the end of chapter five. Thanks for listening.